Good morning, it's Dr. Matthew Dunn, host of the Future of Email Marketing, and my guest early morning here, not early morning for him, is the famous, the noted Skip Fedora, fractional CMO, email expert, all things digital marketing expert, and famous wearer of bow ties. <laughs> Skip, yeah. thanks so much for joining. Sorry, I didn't get the I didn't get the uh, order of brief for this this, or I wouldn't have had the bow tie on. Uh, well, you know, I I thought about that, but it's okay. It's just all of your pictures are you're meticulous about, uh, yeah. uh, about bow tie in there. Well, start by you can introduce yourself better than I can. So and assume that not everybody's seeing us. So, uh, tell people a bit about Skip. So. Actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna riff off the bow tie for a second because you'll learn a lot more about me than than maybe I want you to know. <laughs> so the the bow tie thing. So I do a lot of public speaking, and um, the, kind of the way I get into the 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 mood or the moment mm -hmm. is I is I put on a tie, and it you know it reminds me it's a physical manifestation, but it reminds me that I'm about to be on stage, and it just kind of gets me in the right frame of mind. Yeah, and I, I was, if I'm honest, I was at my college alumni weekend and I was at my fraternity pig roast. And one of the guys who's younger than me was walking around selling bow ties oh, that no he kidding. made. <laughs> and I'm like, that's pretty cool. That is cool. So I bought a bow tie and um, I came back and I had an event that week and I'm like, right, I'm going to wear the bow tie. Well, but then you only have one and a bow tie is common enough that you're sort of like, mm, or uncommon enough that people take note. Yeah. So then very suddenly they're like, well, what bow tie is he going to wear next week? And, and so suddenly I'm like out frantically buying bow ties and I, you know, I decided, I, and I get a lot of nice regular ties at home. I didn't want to just switch to bow tie. So I came up with this really elaborate, oh, I only wear bow ties when I present on a, win a Thursday. And I even had a hashtag for a while, Bowtie Thursday. And so that that's probably what what you need to know about me, uh, like how I how I work. Uh, the other stuff is, you know, pretty, pretty traditional. Um, been living in the UK for 20 years. Uh, been in the industry. I, I was actually figuring this out because I thought it was going to be one of those questions that you were going to ask. I probably started in email 97 or 98. Oh, wow. Early on. I think. Yeah. 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 yeah I. I, uh, whenever there's a conversation about open rate tracking, I, um, I hold my hand up and say that I was, I'm part of the reason that open rate is a thing. Really? I'm not. Yeah. But I mean, I was, I was working for one of the first companies that was doing that and talking about it. And it, it's how we sold email to kind of more traditional brands that, um, you know, didn't really get this digital thing yet. Yeah. And wh why would I care about email? Oh, well yeah. we can we can track your email from cradle to grave. Right. We know if it was delivered, if it was opened, if they clicked on it, what they did with it after that. So, yeah. Huh. So, um, now when you when you because uh, you you your college was poli sci, correct? Correct. Ah, how'd you go correct. from poli sci sideways into the the fun world of marketing, which is a whole different thing now than when you started? I'm sure. Uh. I didn't get into law school, basically, oh. uh, is what happened. And and probably, well, so, you know, we were talking about, we weren't talking about, you were talking about with a with a previous guest about whether the, you, you find the career or the career finds you. And, and <laughs> I, I would say that uh, marketing manipulated a large portion of my life to, to convince me that that's where I needed to be. <laughs> uh, and, the, and the first, the first step of that was I was applying to law school and for reasons that nobody can explain, mm -hmm. didn't include on any of my applications that I had done uh, a whole year um, uh, internship at the local district attorney's office in Virginia. It's called the Commonwealth attorney, but same, same function. And that whilst I was there, we had had just a, a horrendous case that um, the other intern and I were pitted internally against the two youngest um, attorneys as to whether we should, whether there was grounds to prosecute in this, in this 
this situation. And me and the other intern argued that there were not grounds to pros prosecute and, and we won. Uh, wow. So, yeah. Um, but, you know, did I put that on my law school application? No. No. <laughs> no. Did I self-promote myself? Absolutely not. Why would uh, I want to do that? So um, fast forward a couple years later. Now I'm in, uh, I'm getting my MBA. And again, not that interested in marketing. I was not very complimentary to the field of marketing, if I'm, if I'm honest. Yeah. And um, it was somewhat disruptive, I would say, and my professors would agree, in the marketing classes that I, I was uh, <laughs> instructed to take. And I was more of an operations kind of person, right? So uh, I ended up, after grad school, going to work in the uh, call center or contact center, for those of you living in the UK, of a retail bank. And I got into some really cool analysis about how we could route calls and queue calls and, mm -hmm. you know, why, you know, maybe the queue shouldn't be totally democratic, first come, first served. Maybe the queue should somewhat be organized based on uh, the, the profitability to us as a business of the mm -hmm. people in the queue. In other mm -hmm. words, get your most profitable customer service quicker. Yeah. And you can do that. Right in a call center because nobody can see the nobody can see the line or the queue. <laughs> you can't do that in a retail bank. You can't walk over and go, "Oh, Mr. Jones, come with me," you know, because everybody behind Mr. Jones is like, "Wait, what just happened?" Yeah. Um, and um, so, but that got me into really proper database analysis, data analysis. Uh, I used to write SQL um, for a living for a while. Yeah, so that's how I got into marketing. Okay, interesting. And seduced over to the whatever dark side or whatever else. I'm 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 curious because it's it, I I particularly enjoy pe talking to people who've who've been in a field, any field, but um you know email for the for the subject matter of uh, these conversations to realize to to delve into how much stuff was there early and how much we're still working to sort of realize the full use of it right measurability of email which you touched on you know 97 98 oh we can we can actually see if someone's opening the email oh my that's crazy and I, I i it's occurred to me for quite some time that one of the big shifts that digital media have brought to business is is a complete change in measurability right Television era, radio era, you had statistically sampled Nielsen households, and and that was your bet. Now it almost almost by definition skewed to to big and few. NBC, CBS, you know, ABC. It's not like anybody and everybody could put something on TV. Um, and if 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 a business could have made a bet to do that, they wouldn't have known if it worked or not, except for the cash register. And digital media have this. Have not do they weren't necessarily designed for the purpose, but they have these feedback and data gathering mechanisms that have that have have turned out to be integral and, and to the point where now we're really questioning: are are we are we using these uh, in a way we should? Do, are people comfortable with how they're using them? And and you were there early on for those conversations in email. Talk talk about that a bit. What's interesting is so. Um, now, this is a bit of a history lesson for some people. And I apologize if you were there, although <laughs> it might bring back some fond memories. Yeah. But I, I moved to uh, San Francisco in January of 2000. Mm -hmm. um, Ooh, dot com. And doc, right in the middle of the dot com boom. Yeah. I mean, I, <clears throat> just a couple of funny dot com boom stories. I, I went to work for a, an ESP that, uh, well, it exists in a different guise now called Digital Impact. And I turned up on the first day. And I had no idea what to wear. And I'd come from banking. So I was like, well, I'll wear a suit with no tie. And uh, I was sitting in reception. And uh, I think it was the CEO might have been walked by and told me off for wearing a suit. <laughs> right. He's, Yay. <laughs> he's, like, he's like, look, dude, you know, you're going to walk into somebody's office and, and you know, you, you just don't look credible, right, wearing a suit. You're just Silicon Valley, you know jeans are the dressiest thing I ever want to see you in again. Uh, and then actually I wish I'd worn the jeans because the next thing that happened was, uh, the HR person picked me up, introduced me to my, my manager, my manager said, ah, right. So 
first thing this morning, first part of orientation, get down to the basement. Here's the key to the storeroom. Your desk is flat pack. Bring it up, put it together. Yeah. It's going to go there kind of thing. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, this is proper old school startup mode. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and then the other thing that made me realize, and this was about a month, maybe two months later, but made me realize that th I was not in Kansas or Virginia anymore was the guy that sat next to me, lovely guy, just got fed up one morning, made a couple of phone calls, had three job interviews over lunch, had a new job by the end of the day. So between getting fed up and packing his box was six yeah. hours tops. Wow. Right? Wow. And, you know, there was, it was a great time to be in the Valley. There was a new launch every, every night. I mean, you could go and yeah. like, it, it, if you were so inclined, you could drink for free all the time. <laughs> and well, you and didn't it, have to pay to eat either. And it was that ferment period, which it sometimes feels like we're in again, honestly. It, it does. It yeah. does. Of, of but, stupid. <laughs> right. Stupid could get funded. Yeah. Well, stupid could get funded, actually, and, and did. And I'm, did. I'm sitting, I'm now sit, feeling really guilty because I'm, I'm sitting in an air on chair right now but that was the thing right it, like everybody had me it. too <laughs> you had to have the air on chairs you had to have, you had the, to have the yeah the, the foosball or the table yeah. tennis or yeah. whatever yeah. and yeah. free sodas in the office and it was a crazy time and then it ended yeah. and it ended hard yeah and all the parties that had been launch parties you know all of a sudden like you, when you think about uh the economy a downturn in the economy which you don't think about is um oh Right. Like bars and restaurants, they're going to be the first to suffer. Yeah. And yeah. so uh, I remember bars in the Valley would have um, what they were calling pink slip parties. So if you walked in and showed that you'd been laid off that week, yeah. you got a free drink. Yeah. Oof. Um, it was it was a crazy time. And, and that's where we get to the measurement piece, because so now instead of trying to sell email marketing to dot coms who get it, because they're trying to do something all online anyway. We're now going to traditional retailers, traditional brands and saying, Hey, we've got this new thing called email and it's going to be great for you. Mm -hmm. And they're like, I don't get it. And so we, you know, we had to describe it like, ah, oh, well, it's, it's kind of like direct mail only everything's trackable. And we thought that would be great. Every marketer surely wants to know yeah. if their piece was opened. Oops. If the piece is opened, if it was clicked, right. you know, what happened? And we got a lot of pushback from traditional marketers because they didn't want to know. They didn't want to know, right? Because suddenly they were on the hook. They were accountable. And so in the early days, hmm. you know, we spent a lot of time, like the strategy side of the business spent a lot of time taking the metrics that we had and kind of explaining how you can put can convert those into the metrics that the rest of the business was used to. Right. Right. So how do you take an email and compare it to your Nielsen numbers for your commercial? Yeah. Kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. 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 And, and my guess is some of the resistance, I'm curious your reaction to this. Some of the resistance would initially at least be articulated in terms of it, it, one, <laughs> I'm not sure I want everybody to know, because uh, we've been getting along and, and having our budgets based on on guesswork. It's the old uh, Sam Wanamaker, you know, half my advertising is wasted. I just don't know which half, right? Um, yeah. And then there was probably an attempt to shoehorn the new measures, uh, in you know, new measures available in into the old metrics, right? We have to take this email stuff and figure out how to make it fit in what looks like a paper envelope, metaphorically speaking, because that's that's how we're used to running things, and if it doesn't fit the operating paradigm for direct mail, right? We can't use it. It's like, this is a different beast, guys. Uh, eventually, you won't do that, probably. It, that That's right. And, and actually, the it wasn't so much changing the operating paradigm in the marketing department, mm -hmm. but it was uh, educating, like, the finance department. Because they'd gotten used to and were yeah. very comfortable. With one, an interesting one, one of the first gigs I had at the bank uh, I moved out of the call uh, the call center and into what we call the customer marketing information center. And one of my first jobs was every quarter I took 
all of the post campaign analyses that was done across all the marketing yeah. and calculated uh, how much money we should have posted in the quarter and compared that to what we reported to Wall Street. Right. And it was always seven or eight X, always. Wow. So marketing is claiming the same revenue dollar seven or eight times. Yeah. Fi and finance was happy with that. They were fine <laughs> with that. So <laughs> suddenly it's like, so that, the, you know, there was some reluctance on the finance department side too, to say, well, we have this one channel that's a lot more accurate. Hmm. Well, yeah, but that means that I've got to now tell my managers and my superiors in the finance organization that all the stuff we've been reporting previously is wrong. Right. And it, it is just wrong. So yeah, it was, it was a really interesting time to be, um, to be in that game. F funny thing about, uh, the Wanamaker quote you mentioned. Um, so that's probably the most famous quote about attribution. Hmm. And, um, you can actually attribute that quote to two different people. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. 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 So, uh, the, one of the founders of Lever brothers over here is supposed to have said the same thing. Interesting. Interesting. Now it, tur it turns yeah. out neither, neither one of them said it. Interesting. But <laughs> great story. Well, that's that uh, yeah, ap apocryphal tends apocryphal aside from aside from, uh, Mark Twain, who, you know, if there's an apocryphal witty quote, he actually probably said it, but yeah, usually we, we want to hang the, the quip on, on a figure that, that it fits. And, and he who writes the history books, writes the history, not, not what actually happened. Right. Maybe Richard right. III wasn't that bad a guy. Um, I'm curious, <laughs> uh, right. wow. sorry, jumping around. Um, you're 20 years in the UK, uh, born in, if I recall, born, or raised in, in Virginia. Tell, talk to me a bit about the contrast and focus it on marketing if you'd, if you'd like, or life if not, uh, between UK and US. Um, I think the biggest thing I noticed straight away, and, and it's still true to, a, in fact, I know it's true because I heard somebody say it just a couple of weeks ago. Um, the British are very reserved and they don't, um, they don't do self-promotion well, or hmm. really at, at all. So if you ask a British marketer to compare the British market, you know, marketing in Britain to marketing in the U S mm -hmm. they'll always say, Oh, the U S is a couple of years ahead of us. And the reality is that's not true. Okay. Uh, in fact, in a lot of cases, it's, it's just the opposite. Um, and you know, one of the benefits of having, uh, smaller lists, um, and you know, all that, all that, all that can bring. Mm -hmm. Obviously, economies of scale are lower, but you can be a lot more nimble, and you have to be a lot more efficient uh, to to get the same out of that list. So, um, you know, I think in terms of marketing, that's that's one sort of myth I would love to help bust uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. Okay. Um, other than that. Uh, the, I think the other big difference is, and it's, this may be a, a London thing, but it, no, I'm not, I'm not going to go that far. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a British thing is there's a lot of creativity here, a mm -hmm. lot of creativity. And, um, and it's, it's not normally creativity for creativity's sake. Uh, it's, it's all built around a, a you know, strategy and with the goal of getting results. And I'm not saying that that doesn't happen in the U S um, mm -hmm. I'm not, trying to disparage the U S at all. Um, but I think, um, you know, there's less, uh, I say, I'd say there's less variation. The, the really good stuff in the U S is, is comparable to the really good stuff here, but I'd say the really bad stuff in the U S is, is worse <laughs> than the, the bad stuff here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and I'm, th I'm thinking about like crazy Eddie, that kind of thing. Right. Okay. That, that wouldn't, that wouldn't work here anyway. So wouldn't, yeah, wouldn't, somebody wouldn't, wouldn't fly. We're British, right? <laughs> somebody shouting, I got deals. No, yeah. That's not yeah. Gonna, yeah. Gonna. Well, there's, there, I mean, there's a huckster, there's, there's a huckster aspect of American culture that's been there forever. And it certainly finds its way out uh, in, in digital channels and you know, just look at your inbox and go, oh, really, you sent me that. Yeah. You think I'm going to respond to that? Oh, yeah. 
um, the create, and create, create the creative, cre you know, creativity broadly as a field. It's like, I believe it's the number one export for, for Britain. I mean, you start toting up what happens in music and film and that it like, it's like, it, it, there, there's a, there's, there's a real sea of, uh, as you said, creativity there. And that's a heck of a resource for the disciplines of marketing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, um, I, yeah, if it's if it's not the number one export, it's going to be number two behind financial services. Yeah, uh, but <laughs> you know, if you think about um, just the the amount of uh, film and television that comes out of the UK, but yeah. also other things, things that people think are completely American, yeah. like right. auto racing. Right, right, right. The, the number of British engineers in NASCAR <laughs> is is shocking. Yeah. Right. Because auto racing is a is a big industry here, you know, uh, for the for the whole world. Um, you know, the UK supplies drivers, engineers, car designers, all that kind of stuff. So it, it expands out past just, you know, the creativity in the sort of traditional sense of pictures and stories and stuff like that. <laughs> it's interesting. A, a friend of mine who's a Jaguar, quite a Jaguar enthusiast, has a bumper sticker that says the f parts falling off this car are of the finest British workmanship. <laughs> yeah, Jaguar went through a period. Yeah. Uh, of, of <laughs> suffering through that, actually. My, yeah, yeah, the, my, the um, focus, I'm going to focus on e email a little more narrowly. Um, it struck me as I've started to learn a, a bit and meet people in the field that, that uh, the UK is this hotbed of email marketing, like half the people I know, if you say, who are the people who really understand this? I'd be going, oh, UK, US, UK, UK, like really a lot. Why? Because you're there. Um, no, I'd love to take credit, but I'm, I, no, <laughs> that's even even my ego won't let me get away with that. Okay. Uh, I think, so first off, you're right, um, that there is, um, there is a lot of talent, uh, email talent in the UK. And I think it's so email has always been um, uh, uh, an industry of collaboration. Sure, we all compete, but at the end of the day, we go to conferences and we hang out and we talk and we share ideas. And that's kind of the way email has always been. But because, because the UK email industry is smaller. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think there was there was almost a there was almost a concentration effect there. Okay. So and and without naming names, you know some of the big U.S. email players, um, that kind of collegial collaboration ethos yeah. was yeah. only at the senior levels. Yeah. Once you started to get down into the rank and file, you know they didn't want to associate with a competitor and they didn't want to do stuff. So. You know, a lot of times we'd have a new uh, ESP come over from the States. We have a really strong uh, email marketing council as part of the DMA. Yep. And, you know, always try to get them involved. And, you know, it would take sometimes years, if ever, to get them interested because they didn't want to be in a room with their competitors. Right. Okay. Okay. So a couple, a couple of threads there. It's, it's really interesting to hear. I mean, one, it sounds like you've got the, have you read Richard Florida, uh, Rise of the Creative Class? He's, he's got two or three books about the creative class thesis, but you know, the gist of it is when you get a concentration of people in a field who do get along and talk, you get and it, tend to get an explosion of innovation in that field. And though that, that proximity, Silicon Valley, which you, you know, where you were, um, had that going on. It sounds like you've got a, you know, email valley thing going on in the UK. Oh, why did we never think of that? Oh, we could have branded that. You could have branded the heck out of that. Here we go. We got, uh, we started it right now. Email valley. Uh, second one, and this is intriguing because I hadn't really thought about this before. Um, in the, in the domain of, in the domain of digital, you know, email is kind of the old dog. It's been around longer. And the, the the technical foundations weren't weren't laid down by guys with VC funding looking to make a zillion dollar exit. I mean, this is this is it's my my quip last last free range Mustang. We've got 
we've got a legit set of internet standards not owned by anyone that are still serving the purpose they were designed for and haven't really been vacuumed off and down some uh, proprietary alley by some monopoly somewhere. So many industries digital um, in the U.S. It tends to be the you know the the, the race for the, the race for the exit. Um, yeah, and and that's why you don't want to be in a room with the competitors because you might say something that gives away your secret sauce and then, oh where are we going to be, um, which is antithetical to collaboration across a field as a whole. Um, it sounds like the center of gravity for email kind of shifted across the pond there and you've got email value right. going. Yeah, I think so. And I, and I think part of it was, so part of it was an us against them kind of thing. So we, you know, we, we all um, felt uh, a bit put, I mean, even though I worked for an American company, there's still a bit of us against them in the, in the industry. Mm -hmm. You know, we had an email trade association. Oh, it's got to be 10 years before the U.S. had one. Mm -hmm. oh. uh, you know, and when, when Jeannie formed the EEC, I'm assuming, I think the EEC was the first email trade association in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we'd, we'd already gone through our, we formed it, and then we realized that, oh, it takes a lot of money to run a trade association, and we sold out to the DMA and... Mm. You know, and, and one of the proudest uh, moments for me was as part of that transaction, we had to get the DMA to agree to opt in. They didn't want to buy wow. us or they they wouldn't. They wanted us to switch to opt out. And we're like, no, if it's not opt in, we're not coming. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Stuck to your principles. So, well, we didn't have much to lose, really. So I, think, I think when we wound the thing up, we had enough money for a big party. Uh, and that was well, about you, it. Yeah, I mean that's a nice throwaway comment, but there's a there's a funny uh, there's there's a funny super strong ethics streak in in the email space, which I have to say I I I, I really admire and respect that you know that you would hold hold your ground about opt in versus opt out when you had nothing to lose. You didn't want to lose the sale, but you still held your ground. Why? Um, I, th I think like most email marketers, we can see the writing on the wall and the writing on the wall was, uh, just cause you can, doesn't mean you should. Hmm. And if we, if we continue to, uh, just assume that people want to hear what we have to say, uh, it's going to come back to bite us. And lo and behold, even though we stuck to our yeah. opt-in standard and to be a DMA member, you had to be an opt-in, you know, go an opt-in route. Mm -hmm. You know, not everybody did stick to that. And now we've got, you know, umpteen number of privacy regulations or privacy yeah. regulations. And, you know, it's, it's, we've created a rod for our own back. Yeah. And, and you can, you can, you can, you can broaden that statement to like, digital almost across the board. I mean, the, the, the morning we're sitting here having this conversation, Apple has flipped the switch on iOS 14.5 and all of a sudden apps have to get my permission to, to track me or to track me elsewhere. And it's, you know, you, you know, you've, you know, you've read up on it. Huge. Oh my goodness. Effects on, on digital advertising. Why? Because so many people were, were just like, because they can, not because they should, for 20 years worth of, of, of data storage and SQL queries about every little minute fact about your life and behavior uh, based on that thing in your pocket or on your desk. And, and now we're pushing back a little bit going, oh, uh, you know what? We, you didn't actually ask us. <laughs> Hang on a minute. <laughs> you didn't ask. Yeah, my worry about that, though, hmm. is the same, the same kind of thing that we saw uh, with the GDPR implementation. So first off, you know, I'm going to upgrade my phone. And then, I mean, I don't know how many, I don't actually know how many apps I have on my phone, but it's a lot. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and, little. you know, so basically you're going to upgrade your OS and then every, every time you go into an app, it's going to ask you. And, you know, for most apps, well, let's say 50% of apps, you're not going into the app to waste time. You, you know, you're not going into the app 
want to get something done. To entertain, yeah, you're going in to get something done, which means now I've got this question in front of me and I'm going to have to figure out which wording and which way I want to go. And at the end of the day, oh, I don't care. Fine. Yes. Whatever. Click, yeah. uh, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's, uh, I have this horrible, you know, feeling that just because of sort of nudge behavior uh, in human, human behavior, we're going to end up in a place in six months time that isn't too different to now. Hmm. But Apple will be able to say, but we did everything we could. Yeah, uh, maybe. And maybe. and and the consumers are still angry. It'll be interesting to see if the, uh, well, what, we won't get the stats. It'd be interesting to find out if behavior about that more explicit opt-in, that yes, you can, uh, differs uh, across fill in the blanks, you know, nations, ages, left-handers versus right-handers or whatever else. I don't, I don't, I don't know, but, uh, <laughs> never segmented on that before. That's a good one. <laughs> well, it's an, that. easy way, it's an easy way to get the first decile, right? Isn't it about, uh, seven to seven to 10 percent are lefties? <laughs> anyway. Well, that makes me really, really unique. I'm an amb I'm ambidextrous. Are so, you? Yeah. Uh, and, and, yeah. and wait, do, uh, Tell me what you do with what, which hand you write with, and what do you do with the with the hand you don't write with, or do you write with both hands? Uh, I have to really think about it to write with my left hand. So I, I write with my right hand. Okay. Um, I have to really think about it to write with my left hand. If I'm not thinking about it, I write backwards. Okay, interesting. So my my body just goes, oh right, you know, you kind of just that's the way you write. Da Vinci. Right hand. Yeah. 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 Um, and. Um, but uh, yeah, it's 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 interesting. Uh, it drives my wife crazy because she's very right-handed, um, and my daughter's very right-handed. Uh, so you know, I get like whenever there, anything has to be stirred for a long time in the kitchen, that's my job because like when one arm gets tired, I switch arms and can keep going. Uh, <laughs> kind of thing. Um, but from a a, a work perspective. Mm -hmm. Uh, it means that I don't have um, a dominant side of my brain, really. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I can be very creative and I want to be on the whiteboard drawing pictures and doing it with charts. And sometimes mm -hmm. I want to be into a, in a spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. And if I've got a day that I'm, I need to be on the whiteboard and my brain is in spreadsheet mode, it, yeah. yeah. Fatiguing. I'm, yeah. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm what's technically known as a right-handed hooker. Um, because I'm I I write with my right hand, but I write like a lefty. The with the hand crooked over really? like this, yeah, it's bizarre. But I, okay. I my I've got the handwriting of a serial killer, according to my sister. <laughs> um, but I I I'm not I, sure how she knows that. It was she just looked at it. She's like, oh god. Um, but I do that that awkward monkey grip thing that you see lefties do because you you know poor lefties like my wife they have to drag their knuckle across the pencil until it turns silver and stuff and i've always written in that totally awkward fashion and i did some some i can't remember college or something like that some tests and like oh right-handed and right brain dominant boy are you mixed up kid nice yeah yeah, nice. Uh, yeah well i've got one of my one of my sons is very 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 on the ambidextrous scale and he's a drummer go figure me too are you really? There mm -hmm. you go. Mm -hmm. And do it, also, we're having a family argument about this. My father says I'm not a drummer because I haven't played in a long time. And I said, no, no, I'm just a drummer without drums. But yeah, once a drummer, always a drummer. I'm, 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 I, I, I'm on your side in that argument. Yeah, because that's not. It's not the most social instrument in the sense of, hey, we'll just no. plunk the kit down and go at it no matter where we live. <laughs> yeah. You're gonna name it's, it's, it's like, you know, hey, come around and jam. Uh, okay. So that requires a car and yeah. like, yeah. you know, yeah. an hour of load in. And, an hour you know, of load yeah, in. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. I've, I've, I've been, I've been the, I've been the ro volunteer roadie for uh, X number of my son's uh, musical activities. And those drums are work oh man and you get enough hardware yeah. you could break your back lifting that stuff up <laughs> yeah i used to have this like army duffel bag that mm. had all my stands in it yeah and and it waited you know that was always my my big jokes i'd say to somebody oh hey grab that would you and it looks like <laughs> an empty duffel bag and yeah they, you yeah know. <laughs> so it's good actually we, it's funny we were younger then 
Yeah, yeah, fair enough. It's funny how many, uh, I mean, back to the creative, you know, cre- sort of creative assets and perhaps the, you know, the necessity for a creative element to, to the communication uh, in email. A lot of musicians that I've had, a lot of people I've had conversations with thus far in this podcast have been like, you delve down a little bit like, oh, musician? Yeah. Oh, okay. What do you play? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a commonality. And I know that's you true know, of I, software developers too. I've never thought about it, but, but music is that interesting intersection of creativity and math. And structure. Yeah. You know, yeah, at the end of the day, music is just math. And uh, some people approach it mathematically, and some people approach it. Well, it just sounds good, which yeah. is just an innate understanding of of math. Yeah. And, um, and you know that's what email is at the end of the day. It's is that intersection of creativity mm-hmm. and and analysis and math. Mm-hmm. You know, makes a ton how, do you, of how do you? Yeah. How do I how do I know who to send this email to? Well. Let's analyze the data, see, and see where it takes us. Right, right, right. And if you're sent, you know, if you're if you're doing all the analytical stuff, right, but what you're sending is is you know crap, <laughs> no groove. It's not going to work over time. Interesting. No, that's that's what we call it. That's what we call experimental jazz. Experimental jazz. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> Although I don't know. Have you seen Soul, Pixar's film that just won the Oscar? I've not seen it yet. I have not don't, seen it yet. Don't miss it. Uh, I mean, I'm a Pixar fanboy. Uh, at the at at any time, but uh, wow, stupendous! And the music was just like, oh, so good, so good. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right, yeah. on the list for the weekend, then. Yeah, I, I, let me let me know let me know what you think. Yeah, it's a, it's a good one. Um, yeah, we got terms like cadence, like in email marketing, got terms like cadence. Like there's a, there's there's actually there's probably a musicality. This will be an interesting question for Kath Pay. Maybe it's like that whole cadence, that whole long term. You know that whole long-term flow of a really effective email marketing program has has a lot of uh, has it's got a lot of groove to it. It's got a lot of uh, it does, and it's work. it's got to build at the right time, yeah. and it's got to yeah. back off at the right time, yeah. and you know it's got to be consistent, yeah, but not monotonous, right? Um, there there is a lot there is a lot of yeah musicality to to email and, and we're, instead of doing it over, you know, a three and a half minute pop single or an eight minute uh, orchestral piece, we're doing it over months, months, months. Right. But um, yeah. Yeah. And you get, you know, it's, it, you, you don't try and don't try and make everything a hit. It's like the guy who's the guy who's emphasizing every, you know, every beat. It's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> what? Two and four, please. <laughs> we, need, we need more triangle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. More cowbell. More cowbell. <laughs> oh, it was cowbell, wasn't it? It was a cowbell. Yeah, it's got to be. Yeah, it was a cowbell. Oh. <laughs> I thought I nailed that reference. I was so proud of myself. Running, running, running gag there. Hey, shift gears for a second. Um, you've gone from working uh, in uh, what, what in the ind- on you've been on the industry side, uh, Axios Digital, if I if I recall right. Um, and now you're taking some of the stuff you've learned there and, and helping customers more directly as a fractional CMO. What's, how's it feel? It's great. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's great. Um, it is. So one of the things that I sort of tell myself before I go into every meeting is, uh, and for a while I even had a little post note inside my notebook that said email is not the answer. But what I've discovered is email is almost always the answer. How so? Well, I, so uh, this is going to be very B two B focused because that's pretty primarily where I do most of my work is on is in B two B. But you know, you, you, it's not like I'm going to click on an ad and buy your two hundred and fifty thousand pound consultancy services. Right. right. That that's not the way the world works. Right. So I'm going to I'm going to click on your ad because what you're you're not giving me the 250,000 pound thing. You're giving me the eight minute read of, uh, that gives me some information that I can use to make myself better in my job. And from there we build up to that mm-hmm. big sale. Cause we yeah. build up to figure out, okay, what are your pain points and what do we have that can solve those pain points? And, and sometimes those things don't match. Yeah. Right. So, and that's fine. Uh, we're just, we can just be friends. Right. Um, so we'll just keep, 
lobbing some information over your way. And someday you're going to switch jobs and you're going to come back to us and it's all going to be great. So, um, but all the things that we do to get people into that journey mm-hmm. uh, costs a lot of money at the end of the day. Yeah. And once we've got them, if we can use email, that is a very much more cost effective way to keep that conversation going. And because it's not a walled garden, mm-hmm. it's within our control. So we have all the data. We have um, total control of what gets, what goes out when. Yeah. You know, if stuff doesn't get delivered, we've got visibility into that, and we've got the ability to fix it. We may not have the wherewithal to fix it, but we've got the ability to fix it. Mm-hmm. So, you know, uh, what's what's really funny is, um, you know, I can't you can't jump straight to email. So email is always the answer. It's probably just not the first answer. Right. Okay. Um, so that's that's the part I've really enjoyed is is you know I, I spent 25 years as a consultant uh advising people on how to do their email marketing and marketing automation better mm-hmm. and um the the problem with and and i always did that or almost exclusively did that either for an agency or for uh, an esp mm-hmm. and the the problem there is you go in you do the big project it's all great while you're doing the project. Everybody's like a big family. Hurrah. We get the project done. It's launched. Let's roll it out. Great. And then the consultants on to the next gig and you very rarely get a chance to come back and, you know, see what the fruits just, of labor <laughs> did it work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, you know, so because I kept getting jobs, I assumed I knew what I was talking about, mm. um, but that <laughs> was a big assumption. So I thought, well, let's see, let's put, put your money where your mouth is for, for wow. a bit. And yeah. Go. Go watch, go, go see if you can make it work. Any, any, any big, what are the bigger, bigger surprises for the, you, for doing the show night after night, so to speak, for sticking around longer and saying, oh, now that we're running this for six months, we've, you know, here's what we're going to do to tune and adjust. Any real surprises there? If I'm honest, it, not a surprise, uh, but uh, a sad realization. Hmm is that um, with all the best intentions in the world, it's really hard for a lot of marketers to, to properly, to, to do the stuff we always talk about, you know, to test and learn, mm-hmm. to keep testing, to always have, you know, have a holdout group and um, make sure you test in every campaign and, you know, get past the just testing the subject line because, you know, the, in the cold, harsh light of day, it's, we got a lot of stuff to get done Yeah, and we don't have enough resource and we don't have enough budget. And, yeah. you know, all those things I knew when I was a consultant, um, uh, have, you know, just been, just been hammered home. So it's, it wasn't a surprise, but it was, I was like, yeah, I should have expected this. Uh, so yeah. it's a little frustrating, but it is, it is what it is, and and you, you figure out ways to work around it. We're 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 taking our metaphor and running with it, but consultants more like this, you know, session player, right? Come in, play that bit, leave, go on, play the next bit. It's not, yeah, we're, yeah, we're 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 going to do the show again for yeah. the ninetieth time in the last in couple row. of months, and you got to man up and you know, you know, get on the throne and 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 play it again, and that's it's it is exhausting. And to keep it, to keep it fresh, to keep it creative, to keep it engaging to the people who are getting getting your stuff, it's got to be that's got to be a ton of work. That's got to be yeah. a very different kind of discipline. It it is, and um, I'm going to defend old rock stars now for a second. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so I, I used to get really frustrated when I would go see, you know, I, so I had great seats to see Elton John in the cap center in DC. Nice. Uh, the new cap center, which is not called the cap center. It was called the MCI center. Then I don't know what it's called now. And, um, uh, and we were behind the stage. So I was sort of like sitting, like looking over Elton's shoulder. I mean, it's a really cool vantage point, especially wow. for, wow. you know, I come from a, th- a bit of a theater background like yourself from the techie side. So I love to watch the roadies running around before the yeah. gig and all that yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, but he's using a teleprompter. Yeah. And I'm sitting there thinking, 
dude, I know the words to Rocket Man. Surely you know the words to Rocket Man. <laughs> but. And then fast forward, oh, 10, 15 years. And I was working at um, uh, Dot Mailer, which is now Dot Digital. And I was kind of the evangelist for them. And we had a really aggressive events program. And I did 57 speaking gigs in the first six months of the year. Right. Wow. And what I discovered is it's not that you don't remember the words. It's that your brain has done it so many times that it goes off yeah. on its own little, yeah. to its own little place. I'm with you. And it's not, not until the, it comes back and it's like, oh, I probably should get engaged here. Yeah. That the wheels come off the bus. Like, you know, you, you can be riffing and going and it's all going great. And it's because you, you don't have to think about it anymore. You just know it so well that mm -hmm. it's just like having a conversation with somebody. But then your brain comes back and says, uh, let's tweak this. No, man, let's not tweak this. Let's not tweak this. You're, yeah. You're going to try to tweak it and I'm going to forget where I am. And then, and then we're stuck because I really have no idea where we are. Um, and, and, um, and so I had, I always had a script on hmm. with me yeah. so that I knew where I was. I mean, it only had to be a couple of words, but it was, it was just, just to, just to anchor you. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, just to keep you yeah. on, on on the track. Uh, this will make for this will make for a heck of a father daughter conversation. But next time you're wandering near a bookstore, and I know that's going to be a while, but pick up pick up uh, Peter Brooks' book, The Empty Space. And there's a section where Alan, I forget his name, the actor talks about playing Oberon in Midsummer Night's Dream for long, long, long run, and how he went about finding finding new and fresh every night, even though it was the same words. It's exactly yeah. what, exactly what you're talking about. And then you can give you that, give that, uh, give that book to your, to your daughter and she'll be the cool kid on the block. Cause not everybody's read that book in theater. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I'll definitely do that, but I can actually <laughs> bring this back to, I can actually bring this back to email. Email. We're on email. We're yeah. Because <laughs> I think a lot of times in it as email marketers, we do sort of the same thing, which is, we create an email program, especially like with automation and it yeah. just starts going. Yeah. And, um, it, you're, you're, you, you don't have the bandwidth to monitor it all the time. Right. So what you end up doing is dipping in and out. And I think sometimes those dips in actually cause more problems than, I mean, you, it makes huh. you feel good that you're checking in on it or whatever. Yeah. Um, but because you don't have a consistent program of test and learn, you don't have a consistent program of optimization, you know, it's sort of a, oh, well, let's have a look at this. Mm, maybe we should re refresh the template, refresh the template. Oh, away we go. Right. Does that work better? Who knows? Yeah. You know, maybe, but you, at that point, you've got a 50, 50, 50 chance of getting it wrong. Right. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. You know, I've got to, I've got to get someone on who's, who's, really lived a long haul owned a program, you know, for a brand for a long time. That'd be a be fascinating to sort of intersect this conversation and say, okay, how did you how'd you get on top of how'd you get on top of doing the show every night? Mm -hmm. And and improve it without screwing it up and without boring yourself to death. And you know, how do you give you know you've got this guy on your list who's been there for eight years. How do you say something of interest to the to that person? after that long and not have him just go, oh, yeah, I saw this already. Yeah. That's the, that's the tough part. I mean, for a musician or for an actor, by and large, you get a new audience every night. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so you don't have to tweak it because they haven't seen it. Yeah. You know, they it's true. It's true. Okay. Okay. With something like Midsummer Night's Dream, they've seen, they've seen it, maybe not yeah. your version, yeah. but you know, they know the, the work really well. Yeah. Or, um, you know, I, I've always, um, I would love to have the opportunity to chat, chat with um, like Lin-Manuel uh, Miranda mm, yeah. about what what was it like having your audience know the words as well as mm -hmm. you did because they had all listened to the soundtrack before they came to see your show. Yeah, yeah. Right? Because then you've also, mm. you know, that's like a rock band problem mm. where you've got the, well, I, I'm expecting you to hit this chord at this moment. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. What do you, what do you mean you decided to throw a riff in there? That's not on the, that's not the album. You can't do that. Yeah, so you're right. 
Yeah. I mean, at least the email marketers, we don't have to worry about that. Nobody yeah. cares enough about what we're doing that they're like, oh, you yeah. threw in a new riff. Way yeah. to go. Yeah, and almost, almost, almost nobody's going back and saying, hang on a second, the header was different six months ago. Why did you mess with it? Like, I was why, measuring why it. Why did you mess it. with my header? <laughs> yeah. Skip, I think we could probably go on for at least another hour, uh, preferably with a beer at the end of it. But I got stacked and I have another guest showing up for another conversation about email in like four minutes. Well, so I, I got to wrap up you. with you. What's that? I hope I didn't ruin it for you. No, this was awesome. This was awesome. It was such, it was such a pleasure to talk and to wander down the field with you a little bit, like getting someone with your experience uh, in, in this particular game uh, and learning about it is a privilege. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, I the title of the podcast is The Future of Email Marketing. And I got to tell you, I think the future is bright. Yeah. You know, so anybody, you know, Anybody who doesn't think that is is a bit of a fool. Yeah, because we're not uh, the you know the thing that makes it the the person to person thing that's at the heart of it is not going to go away. Is not going to change. So absolutely not. We'll wrap up. My guest again has been Skip Fedora, fractional CMO, wearer of bow ties. Skip, where does someone look for you if they want to get in touch and learn more, or possibly engage you for their company? Uh, you can hit me up on Twitter, you can hit me up on LinkedIn, or you can go to my website, uh, www.skipfedora.live. There you go, skipfedora.live. Thanks once again, Skip, and I'll look forward to talking with you in the future. Thanks, Matthew. <laughs>